We've seen data out there that shows there's been softening in the economy in Europe, Australia and other parts of the world, which coincides with the escalation of trade tensions, as we just heard, between the U.S. and China, as well as other partners. This has led to a growing fear that further trade escalation could slow global growth to a crawl. With me here to help explain all this is James Orlando. He is senior economist at TD Bank Group. Um, great to have you here. And I want to start off with, I think that is the big concern you and I were chatting earlier, is that trade risk or trade tensions are always bad, but it's, it's especially bad now. Yeah, exactly. Um, when you think about where global growth is right now, we knew that we were going to go through a time period of decelerating global growth. And what I mean by that is advanced economies were going to grow at around 1% to 2%. You layer on trade risks, trade tensions, and what that does is it doesn't give you much of a buffer for, for that sort of thing to, to play out economically. Yeah. So the risk of recession is higher when you have a lower level of growth. Buffers are good. We don't have them. Um, where have you seen the greatest impact from the, uh, I'll, I'll say, trade war, maybe yeah. trade war light with China so far? Uh, so far, it's been in uh, businesses with respect to manufacturing and business investment overall. Um, if you look at things like the ISM manufacturing survey, um, a level of 50 means uh, growth in manufacturing. And I think we've got a chart here. We're just going to pull it up and take a look. So um, anyways, continue. Yeah, so we're right around 52 right now. Compare where we were about, you know, six months, a year ago. Mm -hmm. And we were around 60, which is high level of growth, which means high level of growth in manufacturing. Okay. Um, since tariffs started, so early 2018, we started the steel and aluminum tariffs, we, and then we had every successive, successive trade tariff thereafter. That level of sentiment in manufacturing has declined. And it's not surprising. We live in a world where um, supply chains are run by, are very complex, very long, and they're global. And so when you hit those supply chains, you tax those supply chains, businesses don't know where to invest. They don't know how manufacturers are going to be going forwards. Yeah. And so it's, it's not a surprise that they've delayed investment and that sentiment's low. It's funny, too, because I would expect, um, you know, I was talking to someone about this today, that um, when you make those decisions or you pause on those decisions, that's now embedded in your brain. It's going to be something you're going to be thinking about in the next little while, too, which is reflected yeah. in that sentiment. Where else are you seeing um, or are you seeing any signs that it's spilling over to anywhere else? Sure. Well, when you think of tariffs, you think of uh, the consumer. Uh, typically, when a business brings in a good, say, into the United States and it's going to have a tariff uh, hit on it, a business can decide, am I going to eat that cost or am I going to pass it on to the consumer? Uh, look through history and you'll see that uh, usually it's passed on to the consumer. So that hasn't really happened just yet, but the next round of tariffs are definitely going to hit the U.S. consumer. Mm. That's going to cause rising prices. Actually, it's a hit to the welfare and the well-being of consumers because they're paying more for the same goods. Yep. So their money doesn't go as far. Um, the other factor is, is that it, it hits financial markets as well. You've got uh, a look at some of these signals you're seeing in the financial markets. I mean, the equity markets have actually been doing okay. I mean, they pop up and down depending on what the tweet comes out from the president. But um, but tell me a bit about what you're looking at beyond just equities and also credit markets too. Yeah, so equities got, get a lot of attention. You know, everyone's looking at the S&P 500 yeah. to see what's happening. Yeah. Um, when you think about what, uh, what drives equities, and we know that they're very sensitive to what's going on with trade. And it's a logical thing. If you think about um, global trade is dominated by large multinational corporations. There are also large publicly traded equities. So if you're going to hit trade, you're going to hit the revenue and the profits of those companies. Yeah. So it's no surprise that... The apples, equity, that type of thing, yeah. Exactly. It's no surprise that, that equities are going to be more sensitive to every tweet, as you said, mm -hmm. with respect to tariffs. Um, the other area is that if you think about where equities are going, um, yes, they're looking for a fairly positive outcome, it seems, because they were essentially all-time highs for yeah. the S&P 500. Um, it's also due to the fact that it's expected that the Federal Reserve is going to cut policy rates. And when you cut policy rates, you ease financial conditions. That causes risk assets to go up. And that's essentially one of the buffers helping out uh, equity markets in general. I know that you've been taking a look also at the yield curve. And I was saying when we came into this interview, that was something we'd be talking about. Can you tell me, first off, just remind us what the yield curve is, what it shows, and what we should be paying attention to sure. right now? So essentially, when people talk about inversion, what they're saying is that the yield on the U.S. Treasury government bond is now less than the yield on the U.S. three-month government bond. And so you might ask, why would someone uh, lend money to the government for a lower yield than for, three, for 10 years than for three months? It, it doesn't make sense. No. The reason why you would do that is because you're expecting that the Federal Reserve is going to cut interest rates over the next 10 years. Right now, markets are pricing for about 50 basis points, or sorry, two cuts uh, to the federal funds target over in 2019, um, as early as July, potentially, mm. and more cuts in 2020. And so what they're saying is that the current level of policy by the Federal Reserve is just too high, and it's going to come down. 
And when you look through history, when this inversion happens, it gets a lot of attention. And it gets a lot of attention for a, a good reason. It is by far the best predictor we have of recession. Mm -hmm. It has inverted before the last seven recessions. It gives about a 12 to 18 month leeway before recession happens. I know that a lot of um, analysts have been watching the, the the yield, and they're like, "Oh, it dipped. Oh, it's back. Oh, it dipped. Yeah. Oh, it's back." So you kind of think maybe you know we'll have to see if it kind of continues. But um, I, I guess the question is, you know, you predicted uh, it predicted uh, all of the last recessions. Does it always do that? I mean, what else do you need to see that act to say that we actually would be tipping in that direction? Yeah. So when you look at recession, it's the recession doesn't happen because the yield curve inverts. It's just one of the many signals. Yeah, it reflects um, what's going on. Yeah. It, generally, there's several stages that happen before you get to recession. First, you get an economic shock. Um, take trade tariffs, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, next, you get a financial market response. That's usually yield curve inversion expectations for the Fed to cut interest rates. Um, generally, equity markets decline. And then after that, if that can persist, then you typically get lower business investment. And so business start getting, uh, lose their confidence. Self-fulfilling prophecy. Ex exactly, yeah. exactly. So we're kind of in that stage three right now. Stage four is when businesses get so um, negative on the overall economy, they start hitting or laying off workers and that hits the U.S. consumer. And then once the U.S. consumer is gone, the economy is gone. So if you say we're at three right now, mm -hmm. what would you have to see or what would, what would be the, I guess, the canary in the coal mine on stage four? Yeah. So generally we're talking about the labor market. Uh, we're at a level of unemployment right now of 3.6%. That's a 50-year low. So the labor market right now is fairly healthy. Wages are growing at above 3%. Um, we have uh, Businesses are looking for employees. So the labor market seems fine. If things persist, you get an escalation of tensions. Businesses get more and more, uh, lose more and more confidence. Then they're going to have to reassess their hiring practices. And so, some of the first things to move, if you wanted to to use some indicators out there, um, temporary workers are usually the first to go <laughs> before economic before a downturn happens. Um, we also see rises in claims for unemployment insurance. So that usually happens when people lose their jobs. And we also tally overall of the amount of job losses and layoff announcements that are happening. I've, I've only got about 10 seconds here, but just what, what needs to happen to avoid that stage four? I'm assuming just it's, it's solve, solve the trade thing between yeah. U.S. and China. Well, that's exactly it. So you've got two things. Essentially, we need to leave trade tensions. And the other thing that can happen is the Federal Reserve can cut interest rates to ease financial conditions. Which uh, I think I know your, your team is also predicting that. James, such a pleasure. Thanks so much for coming in. Thank you.